You know, I've been thinking about what's been going on with the economy lately and trying to put it in the framework of, one, how I view the economy, and two, how the uh, economic establishment, I guess you could say, or just the establishment in general views the economy because uh, it's not necessarily – the aggregate establishment view is not necessarily as sophisticated as economists specifically, even though you know the average economist, I think, is wrong about a lot of stuff. They, they're a little – more sophisticated uh, than the average uh, Washington elite. But generally, it goes something like this. Uh, the, it's the, most, most of the elites still buy into the old hydraulic Keynesian model uh, from uh, the, you know, the 1930s. Uh, well, really the 1940s is when, uh, as I believe when Keynes came up with it in particular. In the 50s, is when, in 50s and 60s is when it was really at its apex. Uh, in the economics profession. And the reason why it's stuck around in the minds of the political elite is because uh, the original vanilla hydraulic Keynesianism uh, justifies a whole bunch of government spending, and it's pretty simplistic, and it basically says, hey, it's a good thing when the government spends money. You see, when the economy goes down, uh, what's the answer? Well, the government should just go out and spend a bunch of money. Whenever there's some kind of economic issue, just go out, spend money, um, uh, go into debt, uh, spend a few trillion here, a few trillion there, and then things will get better. But now we're in a very interesting situation. I, of course, you know, never subscribed <laughs> to that um, to that line of thinking. But it'll be very interesting to see how the folks in the Biden administration and in the Congress adapt now that we very clearly are going into a period of economic hardship, that we are in a period of economic hardship. Prices are rising. Goods are disappearing from the shelves. Uh, stuff is not making its way uh, through the supply chain. We all know this. This is one of the top discussed topics right now. Uh, supply chains are... Uh, I, I'm sure a top, uh, a top search term on Google in the past few weeks. And all this is coming in the wake of the federal government spending an unprecedented amount of money uh, in the past year, year and a half. Uh, they have spent trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars. Um, they have gone trillions and trillions into debt. And yet now the economy seems to be... Uh, worse than ever throughout this entire extended crisis period uh, that we entered in at the beginning of 2020. Uh, the economy appears to be uh, at its worst. And so the obvious conclusion from that is, you know, not not super revolutionary. Uh, government spending has not <laughs> has not propped up the economy, has not made it better. We all know that. I I'm not going to dwell on that fact. Uh, I think that 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 horse has been beat to a pulp uh, over the last century or so. Uh, people with a brain know that deficit spending is not going to fix the economy. However, uh, the people uh, at the top of the political pyramid do not believe that. And so they are kind of in a – they're in a very tight spot right now because if you look at this – situation from the perspective of somebody like a Chuck Schumer or a Pelosi or a McConnell or a Biden or a Kevin McCarthy. I almost forgot the guy's name. He's so unremarkable. They have done, you know, they've, they've, they've blown a lot of ammo on this. They've thrown everything they can at, at the economy trying to prop things up. They've spent untold sums of money, unprecedented uh, sums of money. And now... Uh, they're in a. They have to figure out what to do next because, in their minds, it's their job to fix these things, and they and in their minds they have the power to fix these things. It's just a matter of how do I use that power correctly. And you know, I'm trying not to chuckle here, but obviously, someone with my perspective, anyone who follows this channel long enough, knows that it's my position that they created this crisis in the first place, and I don't just mean that they. Uh, you know, oh, because of the lockdowns. I mean, the spending itself exacerbated this by uh, pumping, uh, you know, inflationary – by inflating the money supply by just pumping uh, printed money into the economy, encouraging people to go and 
uh, scoop up resources and goods in the economy uh, without actually producing anything first. And of course, by uh, blowing a massive economic bubble over the past decade since the 2008 crisis, which has made our economy uh, rather stiff and uh, un what's the opposite of dynamic? I guess static. It's made our economy very frail. And because of this, uh, the economy was very vulnerable to this whole uh, to the whole shutdown regime, which was instituted uh, brief, for a brief period or for a long period, depending on where you live. Here in Florida, it was for a very brief period, and in the rest, and in other parts of the country, it was for a very long period. And the plan of the regime was that okay, well, we'll make up for this lack of economic production by printing money. And so, in doing so, they were able to maintain. Uh, the level of GDP, uh, which is that magic number that the government loves to cite, which is supposed to be an indicator of the health of the economy. Uh, the, the present situation uh, is a great example of why GDP is useless and it means nothing. Uh, G if you just looked at GDP, you'd think everything was going fine in this country, and those of us who live in the real world knows, know that that's obviously not the case. And so what they did was they stifled production in the real economy, then they stimulated consumption. And so people sopped up and, and just sucked up uh, res you know, the goods, the resources uh, in the economy. And now uh, we've got this big gap. There was a big long period where the economy was not able to produce. And those goods have to be, you know, the, the, good, the, 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 the supply side of the economy has to catch up. And the problem is when new money is constantly being injected into the economy, uh, the the real economy, the you know the production side is constantly is falling further and further behind the demand side, and so waiting periods get longer and longer. Prices have to rise farther and farther at a faster and faster pace, and there's no end in sight to this, so long as the regime doesn't uh, stop doing what they're doing. The only way that the economy is ever going to get back on track and it's back to any sense of normalcy where things can, uh, you know, when goods are you know, available reliably, is if people consume less for a certain period of time and you know, the supply side of the economy has time to catch up. And this is just something that our betters cannot fathom. Uh, the, uh, the adults in the room, so-called, in Washington um, cannot allow that to happen. They can't, they, they don't understand why this would be the case. It would never occur to them that this would be the case. Although I guess, you know, you have the example of Joe Manchin at least making the case in the pages of the Wall Street Journal that, uh, you know, hey, maybe this inflation has something to do with all this money that the government has been spending, uh, all this debt that we've been going into, which is financed by the Federal Reserve uh, through quantitative easing. But even old Joe Manchin says, you know what? No, no, no. I, I think we're spending, this spending is out of control. We shouldn't spend $3.5 trillion. We should only spend $1.9 trillion. You know, that's, that's not good enough. Uh, we need people to actually consume less. It's not just, okay, we're going to inflate at a slower pace, but you're still inflating the money. No, 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 no. We need deflation. We need people to save. We need people to uh, you know, to bide their time, to wait. And in time, the supply chains will be repaired. Goods will return to the, to the shelves of the stores. The, uh, you know, the shipping bottleneck will clear up. And frankly, I don't even think we need to have, uh, you know, a full recession in order for this supply chain issue uh, to be remedied. Because, you know, what we're witnessing is not the popping of the bubble. You know, we're, we're witnessing more of a blow off top. And so let's be clear, the bubble hasn't popped. They're pumping more air into the bubble than ever. Uh, although, I guess, you know, we are starting to see a softening in, in real estate markets. And, you know, real estate is a major asset class. Uh, the asset bubble is, you know, what I have paid more attention to on this channel than almost anything uh, since I created it a few years ago. But, you know... I guess what we're witnessing now is um, kind of
kind of a, a delayed reaction to all of this massive government spending, which started last year. And last year, uh, when this started, I thought that – well, I shouldn't say I thought because I was I – was, I, I'm very much split when it comes to the – because the monetary system is so complicated right now, it's hard for me to tell whether on net um, money – the money supply is being uh, increased or reduced because the, the money supply itself is a very, very opaque. We do not have, you know, at, uh, at FRED, you know, Federal Reserve Economic Data, there is no real reliable uh, money supply aggregate. M3 was the best they had, um, although it itself was, you know, was certainly still flawed. And I don't think they, they even uh, still calculate M3. So anyway, back to last year when Trump was president, uh, I made the statement that I thought – you know, as a result of these lockdowns and all this stuff, uh, the, res the response of the federal government, if I remember correctly, was just going to be to spend, to spend, to spend, to spend. And this was going to create inflationary issues. But because the alternative uh, would be uh, a, de you know, a deflationary recession, uh, the federal government and the authorities would probably rather deal with the inflation headache. And that once they started down that road, they probably would not turn back. They would not course correct. And they would continue to keep pouring gas on the fire. They would continue once the once they kicked off the inflationary cycle, they would not reverse and say, you know what, let's not inflate away our money. They would just keep inflating more and more because uh, the, inf the inflation caused by their initial intervention creates economic pain. And then they go, well, in order to alleviate this economic pain, uh, we're going to have to print more money. And... You know, even though it looks like uh, the full three and a half trillion dollar bill is not going to get through, you know, one point nine trillion is nothing to sneeze at. Three point five is an insane amount of money. So is one point nine, but it's not as insane as three point five. And so I don't see any indication uh, that the feds are going to uh, and by feds, I mean, Congress and the, and the White House, that they're going to, you know, quit cold turkey and say, you know what, we need to. Uh, we need to whip inflation now. Remember, uh, back in the 70s when inflation became a problem, they went for like a whole decade. That's why we consider, you know, the 70s to be the, you know, the decade of the great inflation because it lasted uh, until the time that Reagan was president. It was, uh, I believe, the tail end of Nixon, Ford, and Carter. Or maybe it was just Ford and Carter. And what did Gerald Ford do Did he, to rein in inflation? Did he try and stop inflating the money supply? No. What he did was he handed out these stupid pins that you would put on your, on your lapel that said, win, whip inflation now, you know, as if wearing a pin was going to stop inflation. It's like you're the president. You could stop inflation if you wanted to. And it took until, you know, sort of the end of the Carter administration – uh, when Volcker was in charge, that we finally started to take a turn uh, and you know get back on the road to recovery and start to rein in inflation, which occurred uh, under Volcker uh, very early in Reagan's first term. That's why there was a recession, deep recession, right after Reagan got elected president. From what I understand, Reagan took the gamble. Hey, I you know I know that Volcker has to do this in order to get inflation under control. And yes, it's going to make me look very bad, but I can ride this out. And uh, you know, by 1984, when I'm up for re-election, uh, inflation will be gone, and the economy will be doing much better than it was before. And I will reap the electoral benefits of that. And that's exactly what happened uh, with Reagan. So it's not like uh, it's not like it's impossible. For you know what we're going through right now to end, but the last time around when we started down this path, it took years and years and years and years before somebody finally had the confidence, uh, you know, the uh, the intestinal fortitude to go through with it. And I think that uh, you know we don't have anybody with the gumption uh, of Paul Volcker. Uh, or, you know, and Ronald Reagan in the Fed or the White House, let alone both. 
you know, you say, oh, well, Donald Trump, he's a tough guy. You know, maybe when he gets back in. Well, no, Trump was an inflationist through and through. Uh, Trump was, you know, very eager to make sure that the Fed uh, kept printing money. Uh, Trump thought that Jerome Powell was way too hawkish. So it's certainly not going to be Trump who fixes this. Uh, and it won't be Joe Biden either. At least it doesn't look to be. Now, before I go, uh, there's something I want to clarify. Uh, I'm not a Friedmanite. I'm not a Chicago school or a monetarist type person. Certainly, I'm far from it. Uh, but it is worth repeating Friedman's old cliche, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon, because that's true. And it is possible that what we are seeing here in these price increases is merely uh, the result of uh, a limited supply of goods, which is in and of itself a delayed reaction uh, to the uh, the global to the economic disruption caused by the lockdowns around the globe uh, last year, and we're just now really feeling the effects. That is possible, but in addition to that, the shortages of all these goods. Mm, in, in, you know, depending on whether you take the, uh, the opinion that this is inflation or not. If you believe that what we're witnessing is the result of inflation, the way that that would work is that there's more money in the economy, in people's hands, and they take, out, and they take that money, and they go out and spend it. And they have more money to spend than they otherwise would, therefore they're able to purchase more goods than they otherwise would thus depleting the supply of goods in the overall economy. And the, the way I look at it, if this was just a result of lockdowns, which is possible, this could just be all a de delayed reaction to the lockdowns of the, uh, that happened last year, and it's all just now catching up with us. If that were the case, you would not see this frenzy of consumption. Consumption and production would both be taking a hit because you wouldn't just see production. You wouldn't just see the supply side taking a hit uh, because, yes, we all know the supply side is having a problem because, you know, the supply chain is breaking down. But if that were the case, if production uh, being stunted was the only culprit behind our current economic situation, well, everyone who is a consumer is also a producer. You can only consume as much as you produce. And so if there was no artificial or inflationary agent, uh, if there was no inflationary problem here, people would not be trying to consume so much. Consumption and production uh, would fall uh, at, at a relatively even pace because everyone who, because even, because when things, less things are produced, people are earning less. And so therefore they're able to consume less. And so they're going to have, they themselves are going to demand, are, are going to have less demand. Or I should say they will demand, they themselves will demand less. And so you should expect, you know, an orderly decline in GDP. Uh, whereas what we're seeing is, uh, uh, econ is a, uh, a, a, not just a misallocation of, uh, of resources, but general economic dysfunction. There, are, uh, the proper signals are not being sent in the economy, and so, you know, economic calculation does not seem to be operating properly. People, people in the economy, are not making the right moves, and so this is a structural issue. This is an example of a distortion, and these distortions. These types of distortions tend to be the result of artificial monetary injections. No, I don't have a you know an exact measurement for how much you know the banking system uh, has created in terms of money and how much you know new money there is in the economy. I don't have a, a, an accurate uh, aggregate number for the supply of money, but the way that the economy is acting, to me, is indicative of 
uh, and in, you know of inflationary problems. These are not just prices rising. Because when prices rise because of uh, non-monetary related issues, it's it's not evenly spread, or I shouldn't say even. It's not spread throughout the entire economy. It's isolated in certain areas. And I have to make sure not to say even because you know inflation is never even. Inflation is always uneven, um, but it, it it is widespread uh, over time. The ripple of effects of the ripple effects of inflation they might uh, be more pronounced in certain sectors than others, uh, but they do spread out. Whereas when one industry is having an issue and therefore you know they're not able to produce as much or they're not able to deliver their products as quickly, prices go up uh, because of a, you know a supply side shock. You don't see that uh, you don't see a net change in prices in the economy overall. Whereas right now we do, we're seeing prices rise in general, and it's not just gas, which yes, gas goes up and down. Um, it's not just price of milk. It's not just, oh, a bad wheat harvest. There is a much deeper, more fundamental problem. And as of this moment, the monetary explanation seems to make the most sense. So with that said, I will see you folks back here tomorrow.